Hey everyone, welcome back to Lisa's Book Nook. We're reading The Scourge, written by A.G. Henley, and we're on Chapter 6. Two days later, and the Scourge is still here. The community is meeting, trying to decide what to do. I sit with Bear in my usual spot, leaning back against the rock wall. I'm only half listening. It doesn't matter what they decide, I'll still have to collect the water. Unbelievably, no one discovered I spent the night in the trees. I slunk back to the cave that morning, the bite wrapped and hidden under the sleeve of my dress. Unsure what kind of reception I would receive, I was astonished when the three publicly forgave me. Gradually to hostilities that a small community like ours can't afford, Allo explained. I try to let go of my hard feelings too, but it's not easy. I think often about my night in the trees, but Perry and I don't talk about it as I collect the water. He finally tells me a story of sheep, dim creatures that gave their woolly coats to make warm clothes for people in cold climates. But he seems more distant, making me wonder if I dreamed the moment when we touched. I want to ask Callie what she thinks, but I don't dare. Sable's droning on about how the scourge has stayed this long before, how we should remain strong and wait them out. I lean my head against the wall and close my eyes. Even after a full night's sleep, I'm exhausted. I drift off until I hear my name. Fennel can't keep bringing us water. Look at her, a woman is saying. It's Pinion. I can hear people twisting around to stare at me. She's done in. We're on restricted rations as it is. What will we do if she can't collect the water anymore? Then I will collect the water as I have before, Allo says. That's only a temporary solution, the fox says. You're needed on the council, and no offense meant, but collecting water is for the young. What if the scourge doesn't leave this time? Pinion is right. We need a plan. The scourge is always left, Sable says. It's only a matter of time. But what if they don't? Our children are hungry and dirty. Pinion's two-year-old daughter, you, whimpers by her side. Others murmur their agreement. They have a point, Bear whispers. The fleshies aren't showing any signs of clearing out, are they? I shake my head back and forth against the rock, my eyes still closed, and it doesn't sound like the three have another plan. The smell in here alone may drive us out, scourge or no scourge, I mutter. Bear sneakers. The small room we used as a tooling area is sufficient for short stays, but not for a lengthy imprisonment like this. The odors creeping through the entire cave system. My sensitive nose has been barraged by it for days. And it's not only the caves. Bear smells like he's been rolling around in the fer fertilizer pile in the garden. I don't want to know what I smell like. Don't go near Murray, whatever you do. He stinks like a flesh eater, Bear says. Aren't you two get are you two getting into it again, I ask. Ignore him. He's an overgrown bully. Murray is one of the one of Thistle's three giant sons. Kuda is the other one, and I never can remember the third one's name. Exactly. And bullies need someone to put them in their place. Of course that someone's got to be you. Give me a break. It's incredibly boring in here. I need a little excitement. Someone shushes us, and we quiet down in time to hear Bream say, What about the hidden waters? People murmur at that. The hidden waters are a legend, Adder says. We have no proof they exist. Let this be the time to find proof, then. I set up. The legend of the hidden waters is familiar to all of us. The waters are supposed to be safe, safe to drink, and safe from the scourge. It's said they can be found by journeying through the caves, but no one knows where or how long it might take to get, them, get to them. Groundlings have searched for the waters before. They return disappointed or not at all. We pretended to search, too, as children playing in the caves while the scourge was here. Adder's laughter is harsh, like the meeting of a switch and a bare backside. It's a fairy tale, Bream. We don't have the slightest idea where to look for the waters, if they exist at all. Fox speaks up. If we had another source of water we could move to, then we wouldn't be at the flesh eater's mercy when they come. Or the lofties, he doesn't say. Even if we don't find the hidden waters, maybe we'll find another source. 
Are you volunteering to go, Fox Adderass? Yes, if need be. No, Fox, Callie's mother, Acacia, says. Who will go then? Who will search for the hidden waters? Pinion calls out excitement in her voice. Sable speaks. Patience. It is no simple matter to look for the waters. The council must discuss the idea before any decision is made. Let us meet in private, and we will speak again this evening. The meeting ends and is followed by whispered conversations in the crowd. Bear rips into some dried meat and talks with his mouth full. People must be feeling desperate to want to search for the hidden waters again. Can't you feel it? I ask, listening to the low, uneasy voices around us. What? The desperation. All I feel is my empty stomach and my dry throat, Bear complains. Oh, sorry, Finn. I know you're doing your best. He must have looked at my face. It's okay. I stand up brushing the crumbs of bread from my lap. He grabs my arm. I'm really sorry. I know. I pull away and hear him curse under his breath. I'm not angry with him. It's not the first time I've heard someone complain of their hunger and thirst. But I'm discouraged. Despite all my efforts to stock the caves with food when the flesh eaters aren't here and collect the water when they are, there isn't enough of either. I'm weary, body and spirit, from doing my duty while the people still suffer from deprivation. I slouch towards the passageway. No one notices when I come and go now, except Elon. He stops me at the entrance to the tunnel. Here, take some bread and dried meat with you. I'm not taking your ration, I say, and anyway, I'm not hungry, unlike everyone else. Mother's worried about you. She says you're losing weight. You still need it more than I do. I squeeze his hand. It's covered in grime. Ugh, Elin, you're filthy. Why don't you wash up? He hesitates before he answers. No water. My melancholy deepens. I trudge up the path to the clearing. Six packs of water safely escorted in the trees. Perry follows above my head, stopping often to shoot at the most insistent of the flesh eaters. He's quiet again today, but the creatures aren't. They crowd around me, shrieking and moaning in my ears. I'm too tired to react. I think about the hidden waters as a work. If the legend is true, where the waters might be, if someone will search for them, and if so, who? Perry, I call. How are your people doing? What do you mean? I mean, how are they feeling? Angry, afraid, wondering when the fleshies will leave. Really? I guess I didn't think the scourge would affect you so much. The flesh eaters seemed kind of unimportant when I was up in the trees, like so much background noise. Of course we're affected. We're used to having water when we need it, like you are. But what are you afraid of? Dehydration, becoming permanent prisoners, prisoners in the trees, more groundly fires, and you. I stop short, then flinch, worried the creatures will run into me. You're afraid of me? Afraid for you, really, that the water bearer won't be able to keep up this pace. My people are worried about the same thing. So am I, for that matter. I start walking along the path again, trying to stick to the shade. It's sizzling today, even under the sprawling canopy of green heart branches. Have you heard of the hidden waters? He says he hasn't. What? I finally get to tell you a story, I tease. And then I tell him what I know. Someone suggested we look for the waters again, I say in conclusion. And? And I'm thinking about volunteering. He doesn't respond. What do you think? He swings between walkways before answering. I think you've lost your mind. I bristle. Why? Because I want to help my people? What if the scourge doesn't leave this time? What kind of future will we have if we don't find another source of water? Why does it have to be you? You're already st you already stock the caves and collect the water. Why can't someone else do this? And I hate to point out the obvious, but your sightlessness might be a bit of a disadvantage when you're searching for something and you don't know where to look. My sightlessness is my only advantage. How long do you think a sighted person will last wandering through the caves with no light and precious little sense of direction? 
and if the caves ever end, the fleshies will be there. What good would their sight be then? The creatures let loose for all howls of longing and need. They repulse me. What, do you think I want to leave my home, my family, to search for some mythical water? No, Perry says, keeping his voice even. But I think you'd do anything, go anywhere, not to have to do this anymore. He pauses. I would too if I were you. My anger fizzles. He's right. Promise me you'll think this through, he says. What you face in the caves could be worse than the scourge. Much worse. I don't see how that's possible, but I promise anyway. I've reached the caves, but I hesitate before going in. I know I don't get to say. I don't get a say. But I don't like this, Perry says. We have to try something. There has to be another way. Let me think about it. Give me a day. The community's, community's meeting tonight to hear the three's decision. If I do go, I'll probably leave tomorrow. Aloe said she would collect the water, so I might not see you for a few days. I want to tell him I'm scared. I want to tell him I'll miss him. But of course I don't, coward. Be well, Perry. I sidle into the cave's mouth. Finn, please don't go. To my horror, I feel tears welling, so I hurry into the gloom of the tunnel. Later, I realize those were the words the hunter used as the cassowary woman flew away. The decision is made. The council will allow a volunteer to search for the hidden waters. We listen as Sable tells us what the lucky person will be in for. Don't underestimate the caves. They were forged long ago by natural forces as powerful and as inevitable as time. The caves are free of the scourge, but cold and the lack of light can be equally unforgiving. Your torch may not last more than a few days, and the passages are deceptive. Some lead away from the cavern only to return to it, with you none the wiser. Others end, forcing you to backtrack and still others grow smaller and smaller until you can go no further. People have been known to wander for days only to find they've barely journeyed beyond their starting point. And if you do find an exit, the scourge may be there. So what's the downside? Bear asks to nervous chuckles. This is serious, Aloe says. If someone chooses to look for the hidden waters, they need to know exactly what they can expect. I feel like she's speaking to me, like somehow she knows what I'm contemplating. You must take adequate food and water and leave a trail for yourself, Sable continues. It will help you if you get lost, and if waters are found, you can then make your way back quickly. I remember a story from the old days about two children who entered the dark forest, dropping bread crumbs along the path so that they can find their way back home. Animals eat the crumbs, and the children become lost. Nothing edible to mark my trail, then. Is there a volunteer? Adder says. I take a deep breath, and Fox speaks. I volunteer. I can't decide if I'm relieved or disappointed. Fox, Acadia pleads. Daddy, don't, Callie says. I haven't heard him call him Daddy since she fell off the rock and broke her wrist a few years ago. Someone must go, he tells them, his voice gentle. But it doesn't have to be you, Acacia says. She sounds a lot like Perry did. I'm afraid they're right, Fox. We need you here, Aloe says. I'm not surprised. If the three serve as the brain of the community, Fox is our heart. His optimism and good humor is infectious, even in the cheerless caves. Is anyone else willing to go, Aloe asks. No one speaks. I stand up, my heart hammering. I'll go. The crowd murmurs, sounding dubious. I work in the caves. I'm comfortable here. I've spent as much time exploring them as the oldest among us. I have as good a chance of finding the waters as any. Sable says, Child, thank you for your willingness to serve the community, but you must stay and collect the water. Aloe can collect the water. She said so this morning. But Finn, how will you find your way? Callie asked timidly. She's not used to speaking in front of the community. How will anyone find their way? 
Like Sable said, the torches won't stay lit forever. I'm not afraid of moving in the dark. And when the caves end, I can leave without fear of the scourge. And what then? Will you smell your way to the water? Adder asks, his voice as irritating as a bee sting. If I have to, I say. I'll go with Fennel, Bear says. I'll serve as her eyes. There are several outbursts, but the voice I hear is Thistle's. That's outrageous. An unpartnered boy and girl traveling together? Aloe says, thank you for offering to assist my daughter, Bear. But as her mother, I cannot allow it. Better luck next time, hero, someone mock whispers nearby. Shut up, Murray, Bear, Bear mutters. I'll go with Fennel, <laughs> Ewan calls out from across the room. No, Alo and I say together, but no. After a moment's pause, I hear him sit down again. I face the community, clasping my hands together in front of me to keep from squirming. Sable says, Fennel, are you willing to go alone? I nod. Alo, are you willing to collect the water while she's gone? I'll do what's needed for the community, but I'd like a word with Fennel in private before this is decided. Of course, Sable agrees. Come with me, Alo says. I pick my way across the main cave, listening to the hushed conversations of the people. I can't tell if they're for or against the idea of me going. Maybe they're just relieved it won't be them. I won't say it out loud, but Adder is right. I don't know what I'll do when I leave the parts of the caves I know well. I remember how vulnerable I felt in the trees without a map in my head to move by. My chest tightens and I swallow hard. Allo chooses a tunnel where I met with the three the night Rose and Jack died. I realize we haven't really talked since then. When I'm not collecting water, I can usually be found curled up in a dark corner sleeping. allo has been busy with, the count with council work, keeping the community organized while trying to dampen discontent. I have no idea if she's still angry about my disobedience of the council's orders. I follow the rhythmic sound of her stick and stop when she does. I feel the absolute silence of the vast black caves beyond us. It's sobering. I brace myself for a lecture, but instead, Allo hugs me. She smells as unwashed as any of us, but underneath that I can still smell her particular scent of herbs and iron. Her hands clench, my arms, reminding me how strong she is. Are you sure you want to do this? she asks. I'm sure. Why? She sounds curious, not challenging. I want to help the community however I can. If the scourge doesn't leave, then we may have to. We'll need a source of water. Fennel, Aloe says in a clipped tone she uses when she's about to call Eland out for some transgression or another. I'm your mother. I know when you're not telling me everything, and I want to know what it is before I agree to let you disappear alone into these caves. She pauses. Does this sudden desire to find the hidden waters have anything to do with Perry? I'm surprised, but I try not to show it. No, why? You spent the night in the trees with him. It's a statement, not a question. Shock shoots through my belly. How did you find out? Allo chuckles. We weren't born yesterday, child. Shrike saw you leaving the trees that morning. He questioned Perry, then informed their council. We still have to, to communicate with the Lofties at times, even while we're in the caves. Why wasn't I punished? Perry explained how the flesh eaters behaved when you fell asleep. Sable and I agreed you'd been punished enough, given the circumstances. I noticed she didn't say Adder agreed. He probably wanted to banish me. Perry didn't tell me you knew. The Lofties keep their own secrets, don't forget, Allo says. So he told them I was bitten? She gasps. No, I didn't know you were. Are you alright? Where were you bitten? I put her hand over the bite mark on my arm. It didn't break the skin. I think it's healed now. It doesn't hurt anymore anyway, I hesitate. Do you know our protection fails when we fall asleep? Of course not, or I never would have agreed to the punishment. I feel a rush of relief and realize I've been wondering all this time if Aloe knowingly allowed 
the three to put me in danger. The lofty council told us you thought you heard one of the creatures speak, and then it sounded like someone you knew. More relief. I wanted to tell someone for days, but I didn't want to make anything worse. It sounded so much like Rose, but I was so tired, I couldn't be sure. Did anything like that ever happen to you? Allo doesn't answer for a moment. There were times when I thought I heard something that might have been words. Did you tell the council? Yes. There were no secrets between us, unlike between you and me these days. I hang my head. I'm sorry I didn't tell you about disobeying the council's orders and about Rose and the bite and staying in the trees. But since you joined the three, I stopped losing courage, but she waits for me to finish. I haven't been sure when I talk to you whether I'm talking to my mother or reporting to the council. She takes my hand in hers. Fennel, I'd hope that we'd have more time to talk after I joined the three and before the scourge came. You've had to bear more than your share of hardship. The scourge only stayed two days my first time collecting the water. I think about Aloe at my age and wonder how much stronger than me, how much braver she must have been. There are many things you need to know, she continues, but now isn't the time. So I'll say this. You've come to the point in your life when what's best for you won't always be what's best for me or even the community. You must decide on the right course for yourself. But no matter what you do or what I do, know this. I love you always. She kisses the back of my hand. Her chapped lips are warm against my skin. That said, I still need to know why you have the sudden desire to search for the hidden waters. I frown. Allo's words confused me. I'm happy she's not angry with me. But I'm even less sure than before how much to confide in her. What I want to tell her is that knowing Perry makes me think the Lofties may not be as terrible as we've been told. That maybe they're more like us than I've ever imagined. And if they're more like us, then a time might come when there won't be a need to be a division between us. When we aren't confined to the ground or the trees when we can raise our own babies, when we can fight the scourge side by side. A time when Perry and I might stand together as equals, not as lofty and groundling. But I don't dare go so far. Those ideas would be considered scandalous. I want to help, I repeat. That's the truth, too, if not the whole truth. Allo, why does Adder seem to hate the lofty so much, even more than anyone else? Why does he want to pick fights with them? She sighs. He does have his reasons. Did you know he was intended once? I grimace, repelled by the thought of partnering with Adder. To who? Her name was Peony. She was very sweet, and the sight of what raved about her beauty. She adored Adder. Was she all right in the head, I ask? Allo laughs again. Adder was brave and clever, and he loved Peony. But he was reckless in those days, and he never knew when to stop his tongue. One day he was showing off for some friends, taunting a lofty, and the lofty shot at him. I think it was meant only as a warning. Adder jumped out of the way, and the arrow hit Peony. She died a few days later. She taps her cane on the rock floor. People change, Fennel, and not always for the better. Adder became increasingly bitter, more hateful towards the lofties. I suspect he even has a prejudice against the lofty children given to us in the exchange. Well, that would explain why he seems to hate me, I say. He doesn't seem to like either of us, it's true, Allo admits. Adder can be stubborn and difficult, but he serves our community well, and he's committed to the well-being of the people. We owe him a great deal for his service. People have faults, daughter and we must try to forgive them as much as we can. Now, enough about the past. Her voice is all business again. Are you sure you understand the dangers of this search? I tell her I do. You'll only be able to carry about three days worth of drinking water. If you found no sign of the hidden waters after two days, you must return. Promise me you will, and you have my permission to go. I promise. Fennel, 
Think about this while you're gone. I can tell you have feelings for Perry. Feelings of friendship, maybe more. But even if he shares your feelings, you'll always be less than human in the eyes of his people. Little better than a flesh eater. And he'd be hardly better in the eyes of yours. Your feelings can only lead to despair. I nod again. I know she's right, but a part of me, an increasingly stubborn part, wishes she wasn't. By morning, I'm ready to go, at least physically. I have a pack stuffed with food, water, extra clothing, and a bag of herbs for marjoram in case of minor illness or injury. Elon insists I take his warmer bedroll, and Callie gave me her extra dress for layering in the cold. Bear made sure I packed the rabbit's foot, just in case, he said. I also have my breadcrumbs, a pouch stuffed with foul-smelling crampberries. I had the idea to smear them along the walls of the cave every so often as I walked. Their potent scents last for weeks when crushed. I should have no problem following my nose back home, and I'm pretty sure nothing will be tempted to eat the nasty things. I've said my goodbyes to Aloe, Elon, and Callie. Others come by to wish me luck. Bear asks if he can walk with me to the end of the first passageway. I'm surprised, but I agree. He plucks my pack off my shoulder and slings it over his own. We walk in uncomfortable silence through the short tunnel, the crackling of his torch the only sound. I'm stiff with fear, thinking about what I'm about to do. I take a few deep breaths to calm myself, and the acrid smoke makes me cough. We reach the fork in the tunnel. To the right is the cave mouth and the forest. To the left is the passage I'll take to the, that leads deeper into the caves and another, mostly unused passageway that will eventually open up to the outside. Bear hands me my pack. I wish I could go with you, he says, his voice uncharacteristically hesitant. I don't like you wandering in the caves all alone any more than when you're outside with them. I'll be all right. I would have welcomed Bear's company, any company, on my journey, but I wonder how he would have managed in the ceaseless dark of the caves after the torch went out. I know you can handle yourself. It's me. I want to protect you. Do you remember during the fever a few years ago when I was so sick? It would be hard to forget the fever. Many people died and almost everyone fell ill. I was one of the fortunate ones who recovered quickly. You mended my shirt and stitched a bear on it to help me feel better. I laughed nervously. I remember. You said it looked like a fleshy. I think that was the last time I was asked to help help with the mending. I was terrible. I only said that because I was afraid. Afraid you'd be able to tell how much I liked it, how much I liked you. I wore out that shirt years ago, but I kept the bear you stitched. He puts a piece of fabric in my hand. Here it is. I want you to take it, since I can't go with you. He speaks quickly now. I wish I could have danced with you at the solstice. I've been planning to ask you all year. Did you know? My stomach clenches. No, I didn't. If the fleshies hadn't come, would you have danced with me? I don't know how to answer him. The summer solstice feels like one of my dreams, not real life. Real life now is a scourge, hunger, and thirst, uncertainty. I can't tell him the truth. I'd chosen to ask a lofty to dance, but the truth is I'll never dance with a lofty because groundlings and lofties don't dance together. Perry said so himself, so I say what Bear wants to hear. Yes, I would have. I'm totally unprepared when he pulls me to him and presses his mouth hard against mine. His cracked lips sweep across my forehead and cheeks, and he kisses my lips again, gently this time, then he's gone. I lean against the wall in the inky blackness, trying to catch my breath, and a hand clamps over my mouth. Alright folks, that's the end of this chapter. I'll get it edited and uploaded, and I'll see you for the next chapter. Bye bye for now.